Well, I just want to um, again mention that we are looking at the life and ministry of Augustus Top Lady. Uh, in the bulletins, I had sort of a, you no, know, I guess it was more of a leading title, but it is meant to be a subtitle that Christ may be glorified or that God may receive all the glory. As a matter of fact, even though we don't really have technically a time of meditating on the scriptures at the beginning of these lectures, which we do in our services, I've been putting verses in anyway, just hope, hoping that you might see them and um, maybe meditate on them. And I think this one really sums up uh, what Top Lady was all about. First Peter 4.11. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking in the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Certainly everything we do, we do by the strength of the Lord. We certainly accept that in whatever we might attempt for his glory. Uh, if we speak, if we serve, or we give, or whatever we might do, uh, we give him the glory for those things because we can't give anything except what he's given us first. We can't really minister with anything except what the Lord has given to us to minister with. Everything comes from him. He is to receive the glory. And certainly what Top Lady is going to, again, uh, remind us of this evening is that most important gift that God gives also comes sovereignly from his hand as a pure act of mercy and really has nothing to do with us until he actually quickens us to life when we believe. So again, this is the theme of Top Lady's Life. And just by way of quick review, remember we've been considering the evangelical movement of the 18th century in England, what the Lord used to restore England. Uh, we saw how the Lord had brought reformation to England in the first place in the 16th century through, uh, well, actually beginning with uh, Wycliffe, uh, he was one of the pre-Reformation figures, and he ministered in England, translated the Bible into English. Martin Luther, with his um, um, controversy with the church over indulgences and his nailing of the 95 Theses on the church door of Wittenberg. Also, uh, Tyndale, who helped to smuggle Luther's uh, works into England, as well as, again, doing a fresh translation of the scriptures into English. Henry VIII, who broke away from the Church of Rome and established the Church of England and himself as a head so that he would be able to divorce his then present wife, Mary, um, again and have a male heir to the throne, which he did in Edward VII, or VI, excuse me, uh, who embraced Protestantism as the religion of England and, of course, Elizabeth I as well. We also saw how the Lord continued that work of reformation through the Puritans. But we also saw how things began to decline at the end of the 17th century through the restoration of the monarchy in Charles the, uh, the II, his subsequent issuing of the Act of Uniformity that required all ministers to take holy orders in the Church of England, which the Puritans could not do, and they left their pulpits and had to go basically to the country. How the uh, Black Plague subsequently uh, not forced, but at least encouraged all the English clergy to flee to the country to get away from the plague so the Puritans could come back in and minister to the sick and dying with the gospel and how many of them died and how that plunged England into a time of darkness. And we've seen how the Lord began to turn these things around through a few men armed with the simple preaching of the gospel. So far, as I've said, we've looked at George Whitfield and John Wesley. Now this evening we're going to consider another man who is not so much a great open air preacher as these men were, but who promoted the gospel in England through his pulpit ministry, through his writings, and through his hymns, Augustus Montague Toplady. Uh, during the 19th century, there was really no book written in England about the Christian religion that did not contain uh, Toplady's name. In some ways, many of his contemporaries, um, uh, actually none of his contemporaries surpassed him. Very few of them were his equal. Ryle writes, he was a man of rare grace and gifts and one who left his mark very deeply on his own generation. Top Lady was born at Farnham in um, Surrey, November the 4th, 1740. Uh, he was the only son of Major Richard Top Lady who died when he was relatively young at the siege of Cartagena in Spain. Uh, actually, Top Lady never saw his father. 
He died shortly after his birth. His mother's name was Catherine Bates, of whom nothing is known except that she had a brother who was rector of St. Paul's in Deptford. Apart from this and the fact that both of his parents were originally from Ireland, we know really nothing about them. Top Lady was an only child. Uh, he died unmarried. He had no brother, no sister, no son, and no daughter. He lived much of his life in his study among his books and spent much time with the Lord and didn't venture much into society. He had very few intimate friends and, uh, as Ryle says, was probably more feared and admired than loved. And all that is to say that because he didn't have these things, there is really no good biography of Top Lady available as there was no one to gather together his works or to write a biography after his death. There was hardly anyone of his caliber that lived during that century about whom so little is known, and yet we'll find, uh, at least from his writings and so forth, uh, that we do know a good deal about him, I think enough to get a sketch of his life and his ministry. Now, with regard to his uh, early life, he was brought up by his widowed mother with the utmost care and tenderness, and retained, he retained throughout his life a deep and grateful sense of his obligations to her. After her husband died, she moved to Exeter. It was here that Top Lady attended Westminster School, where his extraordinary ability was revealed at an early age. After Westminster, he entered Trinity College in Dublin. That's what these pictures are here, and earned his Bachelor of Arts. After his ordination in 1762, by the way, I'm just going to briefly sketch his life, for, and then we're going to back up and look at a couple of things. After his ordination in 1762, he was appointed first to Blagden in Somer Somersetshire. I'm going, to, I'm going to butcher some of these names, I'm sure. Then to Ven Ottery in Devonshire, and finally to Broad Hambury in Devonshire in 1768. These are pictures of each of those different churches in which he would have ministered. I'm not sure if, I, if this is the actual Orange Street Chapel that he ministered in. It was um, the, the original one, if that is in fact the original one, uh, was built by Lady Huntington. We're going to find that Top Lady also was a correspondent of hers, a close friend of hers. In 1775, he moved to London for health reasons and for a short time was preacher at a chapel in Orange Street, Leicester Square. The change of climate didn't help and he died in 1778 at the age of 38. Now with regard to his conversion, the Lord began to work in his heart when he was only 16 years old. He was then staying at Cody, Maine in Ireland, having been led there by God's providence to hear a layman by the name of, of Morris preach in a barn. The preacher's text was Ephesians 2.13. You who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The Lord brought this sermon home to Top Lady's heart with such power that he became a new man and began to profess a living Christianity. It was then August of 1756. He would afterwards often refer to the circumstances of his conversion with great thankfulness. He wrote in 1768, what we have here on the, on the screen, strange that I, who had so long sat under the means of grace in England, should be brought nigh to God in an obscure part of Ireland amidst a handful of God's people met together in a barn and under the ministry of one who could hardly spell his name. Surely it was the Lord's doing and is marvelous. The excellency of such power must be of God and cannot be of man. The regenerating spirit breathes not only on whom, but likewise when, where, and as he listeth. By the way, this... Um, I was thinking about how Top Lady was converted. He was, he was under the ministry of ministers in, in England. He was raised by a God-fearing woman, and yet he was converted under the preaching of this apparently uneducated man in Ireland. And it just stands as an encouragement to us that uh, though our children uh, may not be converted under our particular ministry or our ministry's parents, uh, that there is still hope because the Lord works of course, when and where he wills and under the means that he chooses. Well, this experience, as you can see from what Top Lady's already said, as well as his study of Scripture, showed him that God is clearly sovereign 
in salvation, as he wrote, the regenerating spirit breathes not only on whom, but likewise when, where, and as he chooses. Now, Top Lady, though he was converted, obviously did not understand the gospel as well as he would until a couple of years later, although for many of us it's quite a bit later. He writes, like most of God's children, uh, maybe this is uh, Ryle speaking here, like most of God's children, he had to fight his way into full light through many defective opinions and was only by slow degrees brought to complete establishment in the faith. His experience in this matter, be it remembered, is only that of the vast majority of true Christians. Like infants, when they are born into the world, God's children are not born again in the full possession of all their spiritual faculties. And it is well and wisely ordered that it is so. What we win easily, we seldom value sufficiently. The very fact that believers have to struggle and fight hard before they get hold of real soundness in the faith helps to make them prize it more when they have attained it. The truths that cost us a battle are precisely those which we grasp most firmly and never let go. Top Lady actually gives us an account of his experience in his own words. He writes, though awakened in 1756, and notice that he uses the term here, awakened, which I think is curious because Ryle certainly believes he was converted, I think, he may refer back to this time as his conversion as well, that is, Top Lady. Though awakened in 1756, I was not led into a clear and full view of all the doctrines of grace till the year 1758, when through the great goodness of God, my Arminian prejudices received an effectual shock in reading Dr. Manton's sermons on the 17th chapter of St. John. I shall remember the years 1756 and 1758 with gratitude and joy in the heaven of heavens to all eternity. He wrote in 1774, it pleased God to deliver me from the Arminian snare. By the way, he's going to uh, say a number of things against Arminianism. Um, if you don't already realize that, okay. Before I was quite 18. Up to that period, there was not, I confess it with abasement, a more haughty and violent free willer within the compass of the four seas. One instance of my warm and ignorant zeal occurs now to my memory. About a year before divine goodness gave me eyes to discern and a heart to embrace the truth, I was haranguing one day in company on the universality of grace and the power of free agency. A good old gentleman, now with God, rose from his chair and coming to me held me by one of my coat buttons while he mildly said, my dear sir, there are marks of spirituality in your conversation, though tinged with an unhappy mixture of pride and self-righteousness. You have been speaking largely in favor of free will, but from arguments, let us come to experience. Do let me ask you one question. How was it with you when the Lord laid hold of you, on you in effectual calling? Had you any hand in obtaining that grace? Nay. Would you not have resisted and baffled it if God's spirit had left you alone in the hand of your own counsel? I felt the conclusiveness of these simple but forcible interrogations more strongly than I was then willing to acknowledge. Pride will do that. But blessed be God, I have since been enabled to acknowledge the freeness of his grace and to sing what I trust will be my everlasting song, not unto me, Lord, not unto me, but unto thy name give the glory. This was Top Lady's fundamental concern in, this, in the controversy, basically what his problem was with Arminianism, and that is who should receive or whom should, well, let's see, who should receive the glory for our salvation. Now, I mentioned this this morning since we are trying to um, correlate the morning services with what we're doing in the evening, that if we anything to do with the saving of ourselves, then we have something in which to boast. We have some area which we can say we deserve some of the glory. Now, Wesley's view, and really our, there, there's a variety of, of uh, views within Arminianism, but basically Arminianism teaches that the ultimate choice of, of whether or not you're going to be saved is yours and not God's. Uh, Luther himself actually held to a form of Arminianism, although uh, Lutherans would deny it. 
Uh, he believed that when the gospel was preached, God works with his full power to bring us to saving faith. And if we will only not resist, we will be saved. Uh, most Arminians believe that we simply have that ability. It's a remnant of the image of God that's left over from the fall, that we are not entirely dead in our trespasses and sins, but we still have some life, enough life, in which to choose Christ if he is offered to us. Uh, Wesley himself believed that um, though all men are entirely dead in trespass and sins because of um, Adam's sin, that God gives to each of us enough grace and to everyone who is born into the world enough grace to choose Christ if he is offered to him. But in each of these views, ultimately it boils down to whether you're not going to resist, whether you're going to use that remnant of life to choose Christ, whether or not you're going to use the grace that God gives you in order to choose Christ, it ultimately becomes your choice rather than God's choice. But again, Top Lady believes, as uh, Calvin believed, and, uh, and by the way, we are, I th we are going to see something of what Calvin had to say about uh, Luther. Even though Luther did not agree with him, he's not going to treat him in the way that Top Lady treated Arminians, and we have to set that aside just, just for a moment. But again, the idea is he's trying to protect God's glory. God deserves all the credit for our salvation. Yes, we are the ones who believe. We are the ones who exercise faith and we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But God is the one who gives us that faith. He gives us the ability to believe and he doesn't give it to everyone. But he gives it to those whom he has chosen. But since he does, salvation is from first to last of the Lord. And when he gives that faith, he will continue to preserve that faith. And that person who believes will never be lost, as we've already seen in Top Lady's hymn. So, to God alone belongs the glory. Now, from this time to the end of his life, which was only about 20 years, Top Lady seems to have held his course without swerving. He grew in his conviction of Calvinism which made him look down on those who favored Arminianism. Now, this was likely what gave him the reputation of being narrow-minded and sour, though no one doubted his devotion to the Lord or his holiness of life. Now, a bit about his ministry. We really don't know what he did from the time of his conversion in 1756 to his ordination in 1762, six years. It's likely that he continued to read and study seeking better to understand the Bible to be prepared for the Lord's calling in his life. We do know that he entered into the ministry honestly, which means that he um, certainly believed what the church was teaching. Ryle writes, he subscribed the articles and liturgy from principle and that he did not believe them merely because he subscribed them, but subscribed them because he believed them. Now as to his preaching, uh, Nine sermons were preserved from special preaching engagements, but nothing of his regular pulpit ministry. But we do have in a letter in which he uh, wrote to Lady Huntington in 1774 some indication of what these sermons were like, his, his regular pulpit ministry. You know, if you're going to speak on a special occasion, you typically work much harder on that, <laughs> on that sermon than you might otherwise. Um, and so... Ryle believes at least that the ones that, that remain may not reflect exactly what he was doing. But he writes this to Lady Huntington. As to the doctrines of special and discriminating grace, I have thus much to observe. For the four, first four years after I was in orders, that is after he was ordained, I dwelt chiefly on the general outlines of the gospel in this remote corner of my public ministry. I preached of little else but of justification by faith only in the righteousness and atonement of Christ and, that, uh, and, and of that personal holiness without which no one or no man shall see the Lord. By the way, I mentioned this morning because this is the quote that I used this morning, that you won't hear those things from most pulpits today, the things that he says that he began with. Justification by faith only, the righteousness and atonement of Christ, and personal holiness that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. My reasons for thus narrowing the truths of God were these two. I speak it with humiliation and repentance. I thought these points were sufficient to convey as clear an idea as was absolutely necessary of salvation. 
And secondly, I was partly afraid to go any further. God himself, for none but he could do it, gradually freed me from that fear. And as he never at any time permitted me to deliver or even to insinuate anything contradictory to his truth, so has he been graciously pleased for seven or eight years past to open my mouth to make known the entire mystery of the gospel as far as his spirit has enlightened me into it. The consequence of my first plan operations was, that is the way he preached before, that the generality of my hearers were pleased, but only few were converted. The result of my latter deliverance from worldly wisdom and worldly fear is that multitudes have been very angry. But the conversions which God has given me hope, reason to hope he has wrought have been at least three for one before. Thus I can testify so far as I have been concerned. The usefulness of preaching predestination or in other words, of tracing salvation and redemption to their first source. So basically what he's saying is he didn't talk about election. He didn't talk about man's inability. He didn't talk about God's sovereignty. Uh, when he was preaching the gospel before, and his people were pleased with him, and some people were converted. But when he began to preach those doctrines, the Lord began, first of all, to make, well, I shouldn't say the Lord did this, but people got angry with him. Uh, for speaking the truth. People don't like to hear that they're not in control. God's in control. But it also brought about, he says, three times as many conversions. By the way, I should just mention, with regard to Jonathan Edwards, he also believed that that doctrine uh, was a powerful means that the Lord used to bring souls to himself because it does transfer uh, the as it were, over your life from your hands into God's hands. At least it doesn't do that, of course, actually, but at least it makes it plain that God is the one who has your life in his hands uh, rather than you. Because if an unconverted person who doesn't love the Lord is told that he can choose to enter into heaven anytime he wants to by simply praying a prayer, he's not going to do it because he doesn't really want it or he's going to save that prayer to the end of his life and hope to enter into heaven at last. But on the other hand, if you know that God is the one who alone holds your eternal soul in his hands, then you will seek after him to save you while you still have time. That's the reason why they found it to be so effective. Now here's another selection from Top Lady written just prior to his ordination that shows us the condition of the clergy of England at that time. He says, I was buying some books in the spring of 1762, a month or two before I was ordained from a very respectable London bookseller. After the business was over, he took me to the furthest end of his long shop and said in a low voice, Sir, you will soon be ordained. And I suppose you have not laid in a very great stock of sermons. I can supply you with as many sets as you please, all original, very excellent ones, and they will come for a trifle. My answer was, I certainly shall never be a customer to you in that way, for I am of the opinion that the man who cannot or will not make his own sermons is quite unfit to wear the gown. How could you think of my buying ready-made sermons? I would much sooner buy ready-made clothes. Not sure what he means by that. Um, does he make his own clothes? <laughs> his answer shocked me. Nay, young gentlemen, do not be surprised at my offering you ready-made sermons, for I assure you I have sold ready-made sermons to many a bishop in my time. <laughs> my reply was, my good sir, if you have any concern for the credit of the Church of England, never tell that news to anybody else henceforth forever. Now, I don't know how those sermons could be so original if he's selling them to everybody, you know, every bishop and every uh, rector that comes through his shop. Now, the character of his short 15 to 16 year ministry can be gathered from a diary he began to write in 1768, which he only kept up for a year. It tells us that he was a man of single purpose, and that's something that we see a common thread running through each of the men we've looked at so far, George Whitfield, John Wesley, and now Top Lady. Uh, they wanted to do the Lord's work to give him glory. And as I mentioned before, if we really are going to serve the Lord and make a difference, and if we're going to live in the way that God calls us to live, 
that has to be our ultimate goal all the time in everything we do, that God be glorified. So he was a man of single purpose and that he didn't spend much time with others but much alone and was always either preaching, visiting his people, reading, writing, or praying. And certainly if he had kept up his journal a bit longer, it would have shed more light on his ministry. As it is, really little is known of his last 15 years. But there are several things we do know. First of all, we do know he was an ardent supporter of Calvinism and a leading opponent of Arminianism. His letters show that he was closely acquainted with Lady Huntington, Sir Roland Hill, George Whitfield, uh, William Romaine, I believe, uh, John Berridge, Dr. John Gill, and Ambrose Searle. I wasn't able to find a picture of Searle, but the others are up there, and other leading Christians of that time. He continually defended the gospel through his writings from 1768 onward. No one among those we've considered up to this point or among his contemporaries seems to have read more or known more theology than he did. Whitfield was a great evangelist and certainly understood the Bible, but he didn't understand nearly as much as Top Lady. Even his opponents could not deny that he was a scholar. It's possible that these intense studies might have actually been a factor in shortening his life, although he did die of consumption, which could be just about anything. They really didn't know how to diagnose these things. They just knew he was wasting away. It may uh, mean that it didn't matter what he did, he would have died anyway. But he writes in a letter dated March the 19th, 1775, apparently to someone who was uh, trying to warn him of this very thing. Though I cannot entirely agree with you in supposing that extreme study has been the cause of my late indisposition, I must yet confess that the hill of science, like that of virtue, is in some instances climbed with labor. But when we get a little way up, the lovely prospects which open to the eye make infinite amends for the steepness of the ascent. In short, I am wedded to these pursuits as a man stipulates to take his wife, for better, for worse, until death do us part, or us do part. My thirst for knowledge is literally inextinguishable, and if I thus drink myself into a superior world, I cannot help it. Here's certainly another uh, lesson from Top Lady's life. If you want to grow in your understanding, you have to hunger for it. You have to thirst for it. If there's anything that you desire to do for the Lord's glory, you have to have a heart for it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Now, with regard to Top Lady's spirituality, Ryle remarks, one feature in Top Lady's character, I may, I may here remark, can hardly fail to strike an attentive reader of his remains, that is, his remaining literature, his writings. That feature is the eminent spirituality of the tone of his religion. There can be no greater mistake than to regard him as a mere student and deep reader or as a hard and dry controversial divine. Such an estimate of him is thoroughly unjust. His letters and remains supply abundant evidence that he was one who lived in very close communion with God and had very deep experience of divine things. Living much alone, seldom going into society, and possessing few friends. He was a man little understood by many who only knew him by his controversial writings and especially by his unflinching advocacy of Calvinism. Yet, if the truth be spoken, I hardly find any man of the last century who seems to have soared so high and aimed so loftily in his personal dealings with his Savior as Top Lady. There is unction and savor about some of his remains which few of his contemporaries equaled and none surpassed. I grant freely that he left behind him many things which cannot be much commended, but he left behind him some things which will live as long as English is spoken in the hearts of all true Christians. His writings contain thoughts that breathe and words that burn, if any writings of his age. And it never ought to be forgotten that the man who penned them was lying in his grave before he was 39. Now, moving on to his death, uh, we saw just a bit earlier that Top Lady uh, moved to London in 1775 on medical advice, and apparently the change of climate didn't do him any good. The doctors really didn't know what 
what to do for him. It was rather primitive in those days. They thought if he got out of the moist air, it might, he might actually recover. But uh, little by little, his illness, a chest condition, uh, again, it was called consumption, continued to progress. He was able to preach at Orange Street Chapel in the year 1776 and 1777, but it was clear that he was drawing near to the end of his life. Interestingly, he was never more appreciated than during his last three years. The London congregation to which he preached was better able to value his gifts and his stores of theological knowledge that had been completely thrown away on his rural parish in Devonshire. If he had lived longer, humanly speaking, he might have been able to do a mighty work in London, but the Lord had other plans for his life. He appears to have come to London only to become known and valued before he died. Now, his death was characteristic of his life, and, and here I really love to read the, the death of those who have been serving the Lord so faithfully because you get to see the kind of comfort. We saw that in, in Whitfield and in Wesley, the kind of comfort that you would like to have, that I would like to have, when we come finally to die, which all of us are going to die someday. But he died as he had lived in the full hope, peace, and assurance of the gospel with an unwavering confidence in the truth that he had proclaimed from the pulpits and his writings for 15 years. Now, two months before he died, he was alarmed by reports that he had recanted his Calvinism and that he wanted to confess this to John Wesley. To dispel this rumor, he decided to appear publicly before his congregation one more time to deny this allegation. His doctor tried to persuade him otherwise, telling him that he might die in the attempt, but he could not be swayed, telling his, his physician he would rather die in the harness than die in the stall. Uh, sounds similar to what Field said, that he'd rather, uh, was it, he'd rather uh, burn out than, uh, than rust out. So on Sunday, June the 14th, in the last stages of his consumption, two months before he died, Ryle writes this. He ascended his pulpit in Orange Street Chapel. After his assistant had preached to the astonishment of his people and gave a short but affecting exhortation, founded on 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14. I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. He then closed his address with the following remarkable declaration. It having been industriously circulated by some malicious and unprincipled persons that during my present long and severe illness, I expressed <clears throat> a strong desire of seeing Mr. John Wesley before I die and revoking some particulars relative to him which occur in my writings. Now I do publicly and most solemnly aver that I have not nor ever had any such intention or desire and that I most sincerely hope my last hours will be much better employed than in communing with such a man. So certain and so satisfied am I of the truth of all that I have ever written that were I now sitting up in my dying bed with a pen and ink in my hand and all the religious and controversial writings I ever published, especially those relating to Mr. John Wesley and the Arminian controversy, whether respecting fact or doctrine could be at once displayed to my view, I should not strike out a single line relative to him or them. Obviously, uh, you, you see some of the flavor of Top Lady coming through and what he thought about Wesley and what he thought about Arminians. Um, and we're going to see a little bit more before we're done here. So the rumor was spread abroad. He wanted to make sure everybody understood he had not changed his position at all. His last days were spent in peace, and his death was full of consolation. The Lord enabled him to say many things uh, in his last days to comfort and edify his friends. One friend wrote, a remarkable jealousy was apparent in his whole conduct as he drew near his end for fear of receiving any part of that honor which is due to Christ alone. He desired to be nothing and that Jesus might be all and in all. His feelings were so very tender upon this subject that I once undesignedly put him almost in an agony by remarking the great loss which the Church of Christ would sustain by his death at this particular juncture. The utmost distress was immediately visible in his countenance and he exclaimed, what, by my death? No, no, 
Jesus Christ is able and will, by proper instruments, defend his own truths. And with regard to what little I have been able, enabled to do in this way, not to me, not to me, but to his own name and to that only be the glory. The more his bodily strength was impaired, the more vigorous, lively, and rejoicing his mind seemed to be. From the whole turn of his conversation during our interview, he appeared not merely placid and serene, but he evidently possessed the fullest assurance of the most triumphant faith. He repeatedly told me that he had not had the least shadow of a doubt respecting his eternal salvation for near two years past. It is no wonder, therefore, that he so earnestly longed to be dissolved and to be with Christ. His soul seemed to be constantly panting heavenward, and his desire increased the nearer his disillusion approached. A short time before his death, at his request, I felt his pulse, and he desired to know what I thought of it. I told him that his heart and arteries evidently beat almost every day weaker and weaker. He rep replied immediately and with the sweetest smile on his countenance, why, that is a good sign that my death is fast approaching and blessed be God, I can add that my heart beats every day stronger and stronger for glory. A few days before his disillusion, I found him sitting up in his armchair, but scarcely able to move or speak. I addressed him very softly and asked if his consolations continued to abound as they had hitherto done. He quickly replied, Oh, my dear sir, it is impossible to describe how good God is to me. Since I have been sitting in this chair this afternoon, I have enjoyed such a season, such sweet communion with God, and such delightful manifestation of His presence with and love to my soul that it is impossible for words or any language to express them. I have had peace and joy unutterable, and I fear not but that God's consolations and support will continue. But he immediately recollected himself and added, what have I said? God may, to be sure, as a sovereign, hide his face and his smiles from me. However, I believe he will not. And if he should, yet will I trust him. I know I am safe and secure, for his love and his covenant are everlasting. By the way, that is one other thing that um, Calvinism offers, and, and again, that's, that's uh, the view that God is the one who begins and ends salvation, and that is the fact if he begins it, he will end it, and so even if he doesn't sense it within himself, he knows from God's promise and from the fact that he has seen the grace of God at work in his life, his saving grace, that he is going to make it to the end. That's the only way you can ultimately have assurance of salvation, to know that God has you secure in his hand and not that it relies upon your ability to continue to believe in and of yourself throughout your life. Now to another friend, speaking about his dying avowal in the pulpit of his church in Orange Street, he said, My dear friend, these great and glorious truths which the Lord in rich mercy has given me to believe, and which he has enabled me, though very feebly, to defend, are not, as those who oppose them say, dry doctrines or mere speculative points. No, being brought into practical and heartfelt experience, they are the very joy and support of my soul. And the consolations flowing from them carry me far above the things of time and sense. So far as I know my own heart, I have no desire but to be entirely passive, to live, to die, to be, to do, to suffer whatever is God's Blessed will concerning me, being perfectly satisfied that, he's, that as he ever has, so he ever will do that which is best concerning me, and that he deals out in number, weight, and measure whatever will conduce most to his own glory and the good of his people. Another of his friends mentioning the report that was spread abroad of his recanting his former principles, he said with some vehemence and emotion, I recant my former principles. God forbid that I should be so vile and apostate. Now, again, this is part of Top Lady's character coming through. I really ought to, to say something about this. Um, he believed that Arminians and Wesley himself were not saved. I mean, that's, that's as far as he went. 
But I should say this as well, that if we're going to criticize him, and really he should be criticized for this because, and let me just, let me just part, uh, point this part out. Uh, Jonathan Edwards also had to deal with, with that very thing. Jonathan Edwards lived during the time of Wesley. And Arminianism was a growing movement at that time. And he had to deal with um, whether or not those that believe that they ultimately have the choice of their salvation could really be converted. And this is what Edwards said. He said, I believe that a person can be a true Christian who believes that. As long as they believe the Bible teaches that, and as long as they believe or trusting in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation and not in their works and not even in the faith that they exercised in coming to Jesus Christ, that they are not making that their ground of hope, but Jesus Christ alone. But he went on to say this, that if they in fact do believe that the Bible teaches otherwise, if they believe the Bible does in fact teach another view, that it teaches, for instance, the Calvinistic view, the Reformed view, and yet they continue to hold on to their view that man is sovereign, then he says, I, I cannot believe that they're saved. A person who is saved will embrace everything that the Bible teaches. But what Edwards was saying is that, and, and certainly I believe that Wesley believed that the Bible taught as he taught. I don't think he was going against the scriptures as, as much as I'm able to see. So I believe Wesley certainly was a believer. He was trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't lay yourself out in the way that he did uh, for no reason, unless you love, of course, the Lord. I believe a person can be saved who hears the gospel. doesn't matter who's preaching it. Even from a donkey, you know, you can be saved. Of course, donkeys don't speak, but I'm thinking of Balaam in this case. Uh, you can hear the gospel from an unconverted person and be saved. Uh, there was a man, Charles Templeton, I believe he's still living, who was a great evangelist in um, Canada and was many, there were many thousands of people that were converted under his ministry, and yet he turned away from the Lord and became an unbeliever, an atheist, and an opponent of Christianity. The man was unconverted the whole time he was preaching and evangelizing, yet people were saved. People just need to hear the gospel and trust in Jesus to be saved. They don't necessarily have to understand everything about it. So anyway, I hope that, that, um, I hope that that's clear. We, won't, we do want to distinguish that. But as far as, again, Top Lady was concerned, Arminians were not believers. Uh, and that's something we just have to accept at this particular point. So let me see. Okay. So God forbid that I should be so vile and apostate, to which he presently added with great apparent humility. And yet that apostate I soon should be if I were left to myself. Again, wanting to give glory to God for his salvation. Now within an hour of his death, he called his friends and his servant to him and asked them if, if they could give him up. Upon their answering that they could, since it pleased the Lord to be so gracious to him, he replied, Oh, what a blessing it is that you are willing, or that you are made willing to give me up into the hands of my dear Redeemer and to part with me. I will not be long before God takes me, for no mortal man can live after the glories which God has manifested to my soul. Soon after this, he closed his eyes and quietly fell asleep in Christ on Tuesday, August the 11th, 1778, in the 38th year of his life. And again, I just wanted to point out that if you want to have that kind of comfort that Wesley had, that Whitfield had, that Top Lady also had, then you have to live the way that they lived. You, you may not be able to do the works they did. You may not be able or, or have the gifts that they had. But you can certainly have the heart that they had and the commitment to serve the Lord in everything that you do. And if you do that, you will have their same comfort on your deathbed. Ryle writes that Top Lady was buried in Tot Tottenham Court Chapel under the gallery opposite the pulpit in the presence of thousands of people who came together from all parts of London to do him honor. His high reputation as a champion of truth, the unjust misrepresentations circulated about his change of opinion, his effectiveness as a preacher and his comparative youthfulness combined to draw forth a more than ordinary expression of sympathy. Devout men carried him to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Foremost among uh, his mourners was one at that time young in the ministry who lived long enough to be a connecting link between the last century and the present 
the well-known and eccentric Roland Hill. Before the burial service commenced, he could not refrain from transgressing one of Top Lady's last requests that no funeral sermon should be preached for him and affectionately declared to the vast assembly the love and veneration he felt for the deceased and the high sense he entertained of his grace's gifts and usefulness. And thus, amidst the tears and thanksgivings of true-hearted mourners, the much-abused vicar of Broad Hembury was gathered to his people. Now, his will also shows his further resolution to give all glory to the Lord for his eternal mercies. And I quote all of these just to give you Again, a flavor of his commitment to the Lord. I most humbly commit my soul to Almighty God, whom I honor and have long experienced to be my ever gracious and infinitely merciful Father. Nor have I the least doubt of my election, justification, and eternal happiness through the riches of his everlasting and unchangeable kindness to me in Christ Jesus, his co-equal Son, my only, my assured, and my all-sufficient Savior washed in whose propitiatory blood and clothed with whose imputed righteousness, I trust to stand perfect, sinless, and complete, and do verily believe that I most certainly shall so stand in the hour of death and in the kingdom of heaven and at the last judgment and in the ultimate state of endless glory. Neither can I write this, my last will, without rendering the deepest, the most solemn, and the most ardent thanks to the adorable Trinity in unity for their eternal, unmerited, irreversible, and inexhaustible love to me, a sinner. I bless God the Father for having written from everlasting my unworthy name in the book of life, even for appointing me to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ my Lord. I adore God the Son for having vouchsafed to redeem me by his own precious death and for having obeyed the whole law for my justification. I admire and revere the gracious benignity of God, the Holy Ghost, who converted me to the saving knowledge of Christ more than 22 years ago, and whose enlightening, supporting, comforting, and sanctifying agency is, and I doubt not, will be my strength and song in the hours of my earthly pilgrimage. I, I do want you to see here that um, the, the whole basis for his confidence in what he has written here is the electing grace of God. Not in his choice, but in God's choice. Now with regard to an assessment of his work, as a preacher, Top Lady ranks at the top among the second class men of the 18th century. Uh, because of his weak constitution, it was impossible for him to do what Whitfield and Wesley and others had done, which was preaching in the open air constantly to thousands of hearers. Yet in the pulpit, he did quite well. The fact that Lady Huntington had him preach from time to time in her chapels at Bath and Brighton says quite a bit, as well as the fact that he was chosen to speak at one of the great Methodist gatherings at Trevecca. By the way, there were two types of Methodists. There were the, uh, the Arminian Methodists and there were the Calvinistic Methodists. And uh, I leave it up to you to guess which one of these gatherings he was speaking at. <laughs> The notes in, that he recorded in his diary from an old friend gives us further insight again into his pulpit ministry. Preach Christ crucified and dwell chiefly on the blessings resulting from his righteousness, atonement, and intercession. Avoid all needless controversies in the pulpit, except it be when your subject necessarily requires it or when the truths of God are likely to suffer by your silence. When you ascend the pulpit, leave your learning behind you. Endeavor to preach more to the hearts of your people than to their heads. Do not affect much oratory. Seek rather to profit than to be admired. Here's a few excerpts from his remaining sermons. I know it is growing very fashionable to talk about spiritual feelings, but I dare not join the cry. On the contrary, I adopt the apostles' prayer that our love to God and the manifestation of his love to us may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all feeling. And it is no enthusiastic wish in behalf of you and myself that we may be of the number of those godly persons who, as our church justly expresses it, feel in themselves the workings of the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ, mortifying the works of the flesh and drawing up their minds to high and heavenly things, 
Indeed, the great business of God's Spirit is to draw up and to bring down, to draw up our affections to Christ and to bring down the unsearchable riches of grace into our hearts. The knowledge of this and earnest desire for it are all the feelings I plead for. And for these feelings I wish ever to plead, satisfied as I am that without some experience and enjoyment of them, we cannot be happy living or dying. Let me ask you, as it were one by one, has the Holy Spirit begun to reveal these deep things of God to your soul? If so, give Him the glory of it. And as you prize communion with Him, as ever you value the comforts of the Holy Ghost, endeavor to be found in God's way, even the highway of humble faith and obedient love, sitting at the feet of Christ and imbibing those sweet, sanctifying communications of grace which are at once an earnest of and a preparation for complete heaven when you die. God forbid that we should ever think lightly of religious feelings. If we do not in some measure feel ourselves sinners and feel that Christ is precious, I doubt the Spirit of God has, or I doubt the Spirit of God has never been savingly at work upon our souls. He goes on to write another sermon, Faith is the eye of the soul. And the eye is said to see almost every object but itself, so that you may have real faith without being able to discern it. God will not despise the day of small things. Little faith goes to heaven no less than great faith, though not so comfortably, yet altogether as surely. If you come merely as a sinner to Jesus and throw yourself at all events for salvation on his alone blood and righteousness and the grace and promise of God in him, thou art as truly a believer as the most triumphant saint that ever lived. Amidst all your weakness, distresses, and temptations, remember that God will not cast out nor cast off the meanest, the smallest, and unworthiest soul that seeks salvation only in the name of Jesus Christ the righteous. When you cannot follow the rock, the rock shall follow you, nor ever leave you for a single moment on this side the heavenly Canaan. If you feel your absolute want of Christ, you may on all occasions and in every exigence betake yourself to the covenant love and faithfulness of God for pardon, sanctification, and safety. And with the same fullness of right and title as a traveler leans upon his own staff or as a weary laborer throws himself upon his own bed or as an opulent nobleman draws upon his own banker for whatever sum he wants. When he says here, um, if you feel your absolute want of Christ, what he means is lack of Christ, not desire for him, but lack of him, then you can still trust in God's promises and his kindness that if you have sensed within yourself the grace of God, if you've experienced those religious feelings or as what Edwards would call religious affections, that love for the Lord that only the people of God have, then you can know that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Ryle comments, I am bold to say that the church of the 19th century would be in a far more healthy condition if it had more preaching like top ladies. Uh, Top Lady also excelled as a writer. In his short life, he wrote several things, several useful essays on various subjects besides the Calvinistic controversy, short biographies on various men such as John Knox, John Fox, Herman Vitzius, Isaac Watts, and others. The base is up here. He gathered extracts from the works of well-known Christians and anecdotes, incidents, and biographical materials. He sketched natural history made various observations on birds, meteors, animals, and the solar system, all of which showing that he had a very active and curious mind. He also wrote a small book, booklet, you might say, called Family Prayers, which includes a prayer for each day of the week, both morning and evening. By the way, it's only one week's worth, so imagine it gets repetitious after a while. His works also contain 87 letters to friends, which are Ryle says, sensible, well-composed, full of thought and matter, and supplying abundant proof that their writer was a Christian, a scholar, and a gentleman. Here again is uh, another example of using what you have to the full for God's glory. Edwards was also one who dabbled in science, and he used whatever he observed in 
the world in, the, in nature or in general revelation to draw some connection to a spiritual truth to help people understand it better. Now, as a controversialist, um, this was an area where Top Lady was lacking, not in orthodoxy, but in charity. And let's take a look at this just for a moment to get a bit of the flavor of how, uh, I think you've already gotten a bit of it, but uh, a little bit more perhaps. Ryle writes this, I begin by saying that on the whole, Top Lady's controversial writings appear to me to be in principle scriptural, sound and true. I do not for a moment mean that I can endorse all he says. I consider that his statements are often extreme and that he is frequently more systematic and narrow than the Bible. He often seems to be, in fact, to go further than Scripture and to draw conclusions which Scripture has not drawn and to settle points which, for some wise reason, Scripture has not settled. Still, for all this, I will never shrink from saying that, that the cause for which Top Lady contended all his life was decidedly the cause of God's truth. He was a bold defender of Calvinistic views about election, predestination, uh, perseverance, human uh, impotency, uh, inability to do anything about their state, and irresistible grace. On all these subjects, I hold firmly that Calvin's theology is much more scriptural than the theology of Arminius. In a word, I believe that Calvinistic divinity is the divinity of the Bible, of Augustine, and of the 39 articles of my own church, the Church of England, and of the Scotch Confession of Faith. While, therefore, I repeat that I cannot endorse all the sentiments of Top Lady's controversial writings, I do claim for them the merit of being, in principle, scriptural, sound, and true. Well would it be for the churches if we had a good deal more of clear, distinct, sharply cut doctrine in the present day. Vagueness and indistinctness are marks of our degenerate condition. While, however, I claim for Top Lady's controversial writings the merit of soundness and ability, I must with sorrow admit that I cannot praise his spirit and language while speaking of his opponents. I am obliged to confess that he often uses expressions about them so violent and so bitter that one feels perfectly ashamed. Neither, I regret to say, did an advocate of truth appear to me so entirely to forget the text in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves as the victor of Broad Hembury. Arminianism seems to have precisely the same effect on him that a scarlet cloak has on a bull. He appears to think it impossible that an Arminian can be saved and never shrinks with classing Arminians with Pelagians, Socinians, Papists, and heretics. He says things about Wesley and Selen which never ought to have been said. All this is melancholy work indeed, but those who are familiar with Top Lady's controversial writings know well that I am stating simple truths. Now, we're not uh, familiar with them, so I thought we might uh, just take a look at one. Just a sample from uh, a letter that he wrote addressed to John Wesley. Uh, the situation is, Wesley, I, I believe I may have mentioned this last week, that uh, Wesley was building what he called a Christian library. And what he would do is he would take uh, the works of great Christian classics and he would abridge them and uh, obviously he would alter them in that abridgment so that uh, the common person might read them and, and gain some benefit from them. But uh, when he abridged them, he would often cut out and rewrite the parts that he didn't agree with and he would make it agree more with theology. Well, Top Lady had uh, just translated from Latin a work by Jerome Zanchius, uh, the Italian reformer, entitled The Doctrine of Absolute Predestination. For some reason, Wesley decided he would take that pamphlet and would abridge it. And he abridged it, of course, to remove everything that had to do with predestination from it. I can't imagine what it must have looked like when it was done, because that's what the topic was. But he reissued it with Top Lady's name affixed to it as the author. So that's something, uh, as you can see, the Top Lady did not uh, appreciate. So this is what he writes, at least here's, a, here's one excerpt from the letter. He, sa letter. he says, hitherto your treatment of Zanchius resembles that of some clumsy bungling anatomist who in the dissection of an animal dwells much on the larger and more obvious particulars but quite omits the nerves, the lymphatics, the muscles and the most interesting parts of the complicate machine. Thus in your piddling extract from the pamphlet, you have thought proper to curtail, 
you only give a few of the larger outlines without at all entering into the spirit of the subject or so much as producing, so far from attempting to refute any of the turning points on which the argument depends. Wrench the finest eye that ever shone in a lady's head from its socket, and it will appear frightful and deformed. Whereas in its natural connection, the symmetry and brilliancy, the expressiveness and the beauty are conspicuous. So it often fares with authors. A detached sentence, artfully misplaced, or unseasonably introduced, or, excuse me, maliciously applied, or unfairly cited, may appear to carry an idea the very reverse of its real meaning. But re replace, uh, excuse me, re replace the dislocated passage, and its propriety and importance are restored. I would wish every unprejudiced person into whose hand your abridgment of my translation has fallen to suspend his judgment concerning it until he sees the translation itself. On comparing the two together, he will at once perceive how candid and honest you are and what quantity of confidence may be repro excuse me, reposed on your integrity as a cider. Anyway, it's strong language that he uses, but um, one thing that Ryle writes is, he says, it must in fairness be remembered that the language of his opponents was exceedingly violent and was enough to provoke any man. It must, not be, it must not be forgotten, moreover, that 100 years ago, men said things in controversy that were not considered so bad as they are now from the different standard of taste that prevailed. Men were perhaps more honest and outspoken than they are now, and their bark was worse than their bite. Uh, one thing that uh, was true of Martin Luther is that um, he often used a very strong language when he spoke about the, the uh, Church of Rome. And as a matter of fact, in the um, Marburg Colloquy, where they were trying to unite different uh, parts of the Reformation going on in different parts of Europe, where he met with Ulrich Zwingli, he continued to affirm that he could not accept Zwingli as a, as a Christian brother, but that he was an unbeliever and he was damned, because he did not agree with him on the doctrine of the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. And Luther was the only one, apparently, who held that view. Uh, his friends did not view and they were trying to convince Luther otherwise and they may have bent the branch back far enough to get Luther to at least agree to work with him partially but as soon as the branch was let go I think Luther sprung back to his original opinion and could not believe that he was a converted man so what what uh, top lady is doing here was not was not novel it wasn't the only person he's not the only person who ever did this uh, if we're going to criticize him for this we certainly need to criticize Martin Luther as well but let's just um, uh, close with these statements here of, um, of Ryle. He says, I leave this painful subject with a general remark. The top lady is a standing beacon to the church to show us the evils of controversy. The beginning of strife is like letting out water. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. We must never shrink from controversy, if need be, in defense of Christ's gospel. But we must never take it up with jealous, uh, without jealous watchfulness over our own hearts and over the manner in which we carry it on. Above all, we must strive to think as charitably as possible of our opponents. It was Calvin himself who said of Luther, he may call me a devil if he will, but I shall always call him a good servant of Jesus Christ. So it's, I, Luther and Calvin were both contemporaries, and it sounds like... Uh, Luther had some words for Calvin as well. But at least Calvin would not do the same. As a matter of fact, Calvin spoke very highly of Luther, uh, called him a prophet, not in the sense of giving new revelation, but in being a, uh, well, spokesman of God. He was a violent doctor that was raised up for such a time as this. Uh, the Lord put Luther into the world because the Lord knew the church needed him. Uh, those are the kind of sentiments you'll get from John Calvin. Well would it have been for Top Lady's reputation if he had been more like Calvin. Perhaps when we open our eyes in heaven, we shall be amazed to find how many things there were which both Calvinists and Arminians did not thoroughly understand. So here's another lesson from Top Lady's life. Remember to be charitable in the things that you say, and how you say it about others. Now one last thing I want to deal with, and uh, then we'll be at the end, and that is to deal with Top Lady as a hymn writer. You know, last year we looked at the different hymn writers of the church. We uh, 
let's see if I remember who all of them were. We looked at uh, Isaac Watts and uh, Charles Wesley. We looked at Horatius Bonner and um, John Newton. Uh, Top Lady is one who has also left some great hymns for the church. We sang one at the beginning. We'll sing one at the close. Ryle writes this, and I think there's some instruction here about what kinds of songs we ought to sing to the Lord. So listen to what he says. Good hymns are an immense blessing to the church of Christ. I believe the last day alone will show the world the real amount of good they have done. They suit all, both rich and poor. There is an elevating, stirring, soothing, spiritualizing effect about a thoroughly good hymn which nothing else can produce. It sticks in men's memories when texts are forgotten. It trains men for heaven where praise is one of the principal occupations. Preaching and praying shall one day cease forever, but praise shall never die. The makers of good ballads are said to sway national opinion. The writers of good hymns, in like manner, are those who leave the deepest marks on the face of the church. Thousands of Christians rejoice in the Te Deum, and, just as I am, who neither prize the 39 articles nor know anything about the first four councils, nor understand the Athanasian Creed. But really good hymns are exceedingly rare. There are only a few men in any age who can write them. You may name hundreds of first-rate preachers for one first-rate writer of hymns. Hundreds of so-called hymns fill up our collections of congregational psalmody, which are really not hymns at all. They are very sound, very scriptural, very proper, very correct, very tolerably rhymed, but they are not real live, genuine hymns. There is no life about them. At best, they are tame, pointless, weak, and milk and watery. In many cases, if written out straight without respective lines, they would make excellent prose, but poetry they are not. It may be a startling assertion to some ears to say that there are not more than 200 first-rate hymns in the English language, but startling as it may sound, I believe, it is true. Of all English hymn writers, none perhaps have succeeded so thoroughly in combining truth, poetry, life, warmth, fire, depth, solemnity, and unction as Top Lady has. I pity the man who does not know or knowing does not admire those glorious hymns of his beginning, Rock of Ages cleft for me, or Holy Ghost to spell our sadness, or a debtor to mercy alone, or your harps, ye trembling saints, or Christ whose glory fills the sky, or when languor and disease invade, or deathless principles arise. The writer of these seven hymns alone uh, has laid the church under perpetual obligations to him. Heretics have been heard in absent moments whispering over rock of ages as if they clung to it when they had let slip all things beside. Great statesmen have been known to turn it into Latin as if to perpetuate its fame. The only matter of regret is that the writer of such excellent hymns should have written so few. If he had lived longer, written more hymns, and handled fewer controversies, <laughs> his memory would have been had in greater honor and men would have been better pleased. That hymns of such singular beauty and pathos should have come from the same pen which indicted such bitter controversial writings is certainly a strange anomaly. I do not pretend to explain it or to offer any solution. I only lay it before my readers as a naked fact. To say the least, it should teach us not to be hasty in censuring a man before we know all sides of his character. The best of saints are neither so very good nor the faultiest so very faulty as they appear. He that only reads Top Lady Hymns will find it hard to believe that he could compose his controversial writings. He that only reads his controversial writings will hardly believe that he composed his hymns. Yet the fact remains that the same man composed both. Alas, the holiest among us all is a very poor, mixed creature. I now leave the subject of this chapter here. I ask my readers to put a favorable construction on Top Lady's life and to judge him with righteous judgment. I fear he is a man who has never been fairly estimated and has never had many friends. Ministers of his decided, sharply cut doctrinal opinions are never very popular. But I plead strongly that Top Lady's undeniable faults, 
should never make us forget his equally undeniable excellencies. With all his infirmities, I firmly believe, firmly believe that he was a good and great man and did a work for Christ a hundred years ago, which will never be overthrown. He will stand in his lot the last day in a high place when many perhaps whom the world liked better shall be put to shame. Well, can someone please get the lights? Thank you, Jen. Well, if you didn't know Top Lady before, I hope you know a little bit about him now. Um, I certainly learned a great deal of him from just putting this together. Does anyone have any questions or comments that might have occurred to you from this uh, presentation? Donna? No, Finney would, um, he would be, I believe, um, actually, I think, contemporary with Ryle. So he would, um, so we're talking, um, Ryle was in the 1800s, and this is taking place in the 1700s. But yes, Arminianism has been around as long as the church has been around. Uh, there was an early controversy that uh, Augustine actually um, was involved in. It was the Pelagian controversy. Pelagius actually was uh, more along the lines of, of Finney. Actually, Finney was more along the lines of Pelagius. Uh, Pelagius believed that we really didn't need Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Uh, Jesus gives us a good example. Adam gives us a bad example. And we should choose to follow Jesus' example rather than Adam's example. There was no original sin. There was basically, uh, you do what's right and you're going to be saved. Now, that's the most, that, that's base salvation by works. That's not what Arminians believe, okay? But that's what Pelagius believes. But all during the, the development of, of the, uh, the history of the church after that, uh, men gauged themselves by Augustine's view, which was um, uh, that God is, is sovereign and he offers us absolute forgiveness and the righteousness of Christ. It's the work of God alone. And Pelagius's view, which is it's the work of man alone. And uh, you are either... Augustinian, Pelagian, or semi-Augustinian, or semi-Pelagian, depending upon who you identified with. Um, but both semi-Pelagianism and semi-Augustinianism were, were both Arminianism. It was sort of a halfway house. God, God does the work of salvation through Jesus Christ. You do need to trust in him, but you have that ability. That was sort of you know, going partway to Augustine and, and partway to, uh, uh, to Pelagius. It has been around as long as the church has, um, well, I think even all the way back to the very beginning of the church, even in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Let's see, uh, Sarah has a question. Probably want me to answer one of the questions on the, okay, well, let's see if I know the answer. <laughs> Well, it, it simply means that no matter, uh, if, even if we are true believers, even the best believer is going to be a mixture of both good and bad because we, we have um, uh, both grace and sin in, in our lives. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? So far? So far as it goes, huh? Any other questions or, or comments? We did cover a lot of theology uh, this evening as well. Donna? It sounds, from at least what I've seen, that it was coming from the church primarily. The fact that he spoke so sharply and so decidedly and put forth his views as absolutes and you can't from this without being an unbeliever uh, made him a number of enemies. But I believe it was in preaching to his congregation the doctrines of predestination, election, and so forth, the sovereignty of God, that got his congregation angry at him. Um, 
basically, if you're going to preach the truth, as we also saw this morning, you're going to tell people the truth, they're going to get angry at you because the truth never flatters man. It always honors God. And uh, if you knock down their view of man and, and you know, their view of themselves, it's, it's going to, to um, offend them in some way. Uh, one way that, uh, and, and it's, I'm sure this is an, an ungracious way that, that uh, Arminianism has been characterized is it's uh, basically the humanizing of, uh, of the scriptures. It's moving, you, you have these two poles. You have what, what, what scripture teaches on the one hand and then you have uh, liberalism on the other hand and the difference between the two as you move from one pole to the other is this is God-centered and this is man-centered. It's purely man or purely God. Uh, Calvinism represents the, the if, I'm not sure if this is your left, I guess, uh, but uh, let's say the far right, you know, uh, Calvinism represents the absolute sovereignty of God and liberalism the absolute sovereignty of man. And Arminianism is simply a step in that direction on the continuum towards more of a man-centered kind of thing. Um, but that's, that's one of the ways it could be characterized. There's a, another hand back here now. Yes, Margaret, you have a question? I'm sorry, could you repeat? What was the blank again? <laughs> okay. All right. Any more questions over here before I take another one back there? Okay, there is one question. Hold on just a second. You saved it on here. <laughs> Well, it, it, it would be, except uh, it is of his view of prevenient grace, okay? Now, what, what Tom is asking is, he, Wesley believed in total depravity, that man's absolutely dead in, in trespass and sin. He has no spiritual good in him at all, no desire for God as he comes into the world, and yet Wesley also believed that we can receive the gospel, that it's not, the, the new birth is not something that God does alone, monergistic, sovereignly by himself, but it's something we're involved in synergistically. We work together with God. Now, if Wesley didn't believe in prevenient grace, there would be a contradiction, but he believed that, that even though we're, we come into the world in that condition, that God gives every person who is a living today, who's, who's ever lived, enough grace to be able to choose for himself. So that's, that's the monergistic work of God, giving him a prevenient grace, one that comes before salvation, you know, that, that is not a saving grace. Everybody has it, but not everybody's going to use it. Uh, not everybody's going to be saved, but ultimately it puts the ball back in your court so that you can choose, and that leaves the ultimate choice then to be you rather than God. But as I mentioned last time, I think, Mary, you had asked the question, I believe, uh, what is the difference, what was the controversy over? Whitfield believed, yes, all men are absolutely dead in trespass and sin, God does give grace, but it's not a prevenient grace. It is a saving grace that, is, that will absolutely bring that person to salvation at that moment, and they will never be lost, but he doesn't give it to everyone. He gives it only to the elect. So that's God's choice. Again, God is the one who's choosing. It doesn't, doesn't leave it in man's court. Now, I did find a quote by Wesley, interestingly enough, where Wesley actually caricatures the um, Calvinistic view, the way that it's often caricatured, and maybe they got it from... From Wesley. God gives grace to one and he passes over the nine. So that one is going to come to faith in Christ no matter what he does and no matter how hard these other nine try to get into the kingdom, they're not going to be able to get in. But that's not at all what, uh, what Calvinism teaches. It does teach that he gives it to the one, but all ten of them are running towards hell and they want nothing to do with God. You see, they're not trying to get in. None of them are trying to get in. They're trying to get away. They want nothing to do with God, and God turns the one around and gives him grace to love him and trust in Jesus Christ. The others just keep on running. So they're not, trying to, they're not knocking on the door saying, and God's saying, I'm only going to let one of you in. That, that's how it's often characterized, you see. You know, 
Ryle expresses the fact that, that his, his opponents used equally violent language, but yet he also says that Wesley, he appears to say that Wesley was not one of them from the things that I have read. Uh, however, Wesley was very strong in his opinions. And um, I mean, he, I've, I haven't verified this, but I have heard it a number of times where he said to Whitfield, for instance, your God is my devil. You know, that God would do something like that. I can't conceive that God would do something like that. So, and yet, Whit, uh, Wesley preached at Whitfield's funeral and said, you know, who is there among us in this age that God has used so powerfully to bring so many thousands to himself? So even though they had differences and though they may have vocalized it strongly, they still had an appreciation for one another. Uh, Whitfield, uh, I think uh, Greg mentioned as well, and I, I probably repeated it last time, when Whitfield was asked whether he'd see Wesley in heaven, and he said no. He'll be so close to the front and we'll be so far to the back that we won't be able to see him. So they saw each other as believers. But in this case, not sure what um, Wesley thought of Top Lady, whether he thought he was a believer or not. But apparently Top Lady did not believe Wesley was. I, I've actually heard others criticize him uh, on, on the same point, believing that if you have somebody of the caliber of Whitfield who can explain to you what the Bible teaches and you still reject it, that there's a problem there. But Again, um, Wesley believed that this is what the Bible taught. I think um, if, if we take him to be a sincere man, which I think we should, uh, he was a true believer. He just didn't happen to see particular points uh, as the others did. Okay, now, Sarah, did you still have that question, Sarah, or did you already figure, did you figure it out? Two reasons why? Oh. Okay. The, the first reason is because he didn't have any family or friends um, to gather together his writings or to write a biography. I believe the second one was because he, oh, wait, why we don't know very much about him. Uh, well, I was going to say he was short lived, but um, that wouldn't be a reason why we wouldn't know much about him. Um, there isn't much to write about him, I guess, because he has a short, shorter life. But um, see, what is the other answer you were looking for? <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. So we got it. Any other questions or comments, Ty? Uh, I didn't find uh, Tom Clayton's. Well, you know what, after I had read through this and then got back to that point, it sounded like the things he had said in quotes prior to that were more severe when he says, yeah, there, there, were, there were other quotes. I mean, he, Ryle makes mention of them and there are places where he actually is saying this, that you're no different than a Mohammedan, you're no different than Islamic, you're no different than a papist or somebody who um, is, is a Roman Catholic, you're no different than a Socinian. The, these are all non-Christian cults and heretics, you see, um, that, that he's comparing them to. Um, so those are, rather, that's rather insulting, you know, that you would say such a thing and make that comparison. Well, we always hope that that might have been his intention. Um, certainly he wanted others to distance themselves from, from that position. Um, whether he ever engaged Wesley in you know, perhaps uh, more personal at a more personal level. You got to remember that he was relatively young. Wesley was was his elder. Um, he may not have had the respect or commanded the respect. That, and Wesley, by that time, may have been so entrenched in what he was doing that he may not have listened. Uh, maybe that's some of the dynamic going on. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Leah. Uh, since he didn't live that long, is there any? You know, I, I haven't I haven't seen whether she was or not. Um, it's also possible she may have had him at a late at a late age. So he was about 38. Um, people didn't live very long in those days. It's quite possible that she was not living, but there was no. I, I didn't run across any any reference to that, so I don't know. 
Any other questions or comments? Uh, um, I'm just curious. Um, they say diet of consumption. Yeah. Did that embrace all kinds of um, diseases <coughs> and stuff? Because to me, I, I, consumption was drinking. Alcoholism. No, it's not, it's not the consumption. People who, who drank alcohol may have gotten consumption. I think if you get cirrhosis of the liver, you waste away. But it's any disease, I think, that was a wasting disease. So a cancer could do it. You know, um, tuberculosis could do it. Yeah, and since it was in his chest, it was probably a tuberculosis. Uh, it could have been, I suppose, a cancer, but most likely tuberculosis. Any other questions, any, any comments? No? Okay.